Okay, let's continue. Uh, this is a part that uh, is always difficult to explain in terms of file systems when, when you talk in terms of namespaces, it's actually very simple. Um, I just described a path name and how you resolve a path name, okay? But in fact, what we can just talk about is linking. Um, so a soft link is, uh, maybe I should just keep that as simple as possible. A soft link is the following thing. You have your root over there, it points to this node over there, and this thing has keys in it, okay? Now what is a soft link? If you take a look at this one, home stain keys, that's the name of that node, and let's say that it stores the name keys in it. That's a soft link. Because what you would do is you would resolve this path, you would read what is stored in that node to discover that you took the wrong path, that you sh actually should have resolved this name, which then starts at the root again, and then you get to keys. Node N5 has only one name, okay? And I hope it's now on the next slide, no. If you take a look at, um, oh, why don't I have this over here, okay. Um, suppose that I would also maintain a link from N4 to N5. Why not? I can easily do this, right? I can have in this directory node not just pointers to these leaf nodes, but also a pointer to that leaf node over there. That is the equivalent of a hard link in a Unix file system. And that's the difference between the two. And when you're talking about operating systems, you translate a hard link into something with the same inode number. That's the reason why you have to stay within the same file system. And the symbolic links, the symbolic names, are exactly what I just described, namely that you store the path name of another file inside a special file, which is called a symbolic link. Is that clear to everyone? So at the conceptual level, it's very easy to talk about these things. When it comes to implementations, there are some uh, nasty things to uh, resolve. Okay. That's about abstract namespaces. Let's take a look at an implementation. Um, what you do in a normal namespace like DNS is you distribute the whole name resolution process as well as the namespace management across multiple machines. You're our DNS expert here, so you're, you're now in alert mode because I may get some corrections uh, between now and the end of this class. Okay, bear with me. How many DNS servers are there? Do you know that? Okay. It's, it's, it's a huge number. Um, I always, I always, I always think I always get this wrong. Uh, the last number that I saw was in the uh, something like 16 or 20 million. It's probably more, okay? And uh, I'm not counting the DNS resolvers, just the, the bare nodes and the uh, system. So that's a lot, we're talking about millions. Now, in order for a system like DNS to work, what you can do is you can uh, distinguish three different levels. And this has everything to do with caching at a certain point. At the global level, in DNS, these are the top-level domains. What you assume is that um, these are, first of all, managed by a number of different administrations. Um, that's the reason why they fight so much over there. And they actually had to install a new organization to, uh, to, to do a bit of conflict resolution. And of course, that single organization was also disputed. Hey, it's, uh, it's all about people. So let's move down to the, to the more technical things. At the administrational level, you could say, it is kind of vague, it's the mid-level directories. One characteristic thing is that every group of nodes is handled by a single administrative organization. That makes life so much easier. So if you have a VU domain, then you know that there's only one person really organization really responsible for that domain. Whatever happens in that domain 
hey, that's your business view. Instead of when you have to manage the .com domain, hey, it's fights all over because everybody wants to have the name in the .com domain. Then at the lowest level, you really have the, the lower level directory nodes and hey, they're all yours. Okay, basically what you're saying is that you're assigning this to an even smaller administrative unit. Um, and what you can also do is by assuming that it's a really small unit and I could be the one responsible for my only single part in the tree, I can do whatever I like. I can change it any instant, it really doesn't matter. This is a very important observation. So the higher you get, the more stable things have to become because, um, well, well, for what reason actually? You can make this assumption that it has to be more stable. Okay. And here you have uh, a very ugly picture actually of, of the old DNS. At the global layer, you have this root node. It's dot. You know, everybody always forgets it, but it's, it's there. There's a root node. Well, actually there's not a root node. Uh, you all know that there are 13 root nodes. Um, and the 13 root nodes collectively are hosted by off the top of my head, uh, around 250 servers. I think it's something like that, spread across. Yeah, it yeah but it's, it's, if you talk about physical machines, I think it's about a, a few hundred. I think it was something like 250. But logically, there are 13 uh, routes. And then you have this top level domain, and basically everybody's assuming, hey, nothing changes over there. Administration, administrational layer, typically what I just said, you have the, these different organizations they are responsible for that subtree. And then at the lowest layer, you have, for example, my own file system. Now, what I also drew here, and again, this is extremely important, a separation between the logical namespace and its implementation, the physical design. What I drew over here are zones, okay? And a zone Think of this as, as follows. A zone is handled by a single server. And what that server does, it simply maintains a part of that namespace. And they may contact other name servers who are responsible for another part of the tree. So again, you have the logical tree and you have the physical tree. And the physical tree is really made up of the actual servers responsible for part of the DNS tree. Okay, how many of you have ever installed DNS at home or whatnot? Good, enough. Do, uh, with, uh, do you also maintain your part of the DNS tree? How many of you have a DNS server running at home instead of hosting it by someone else? The selected few. <laughs> it just, you know, sucks up so much time to keep this up and running, but hey, you learned something. Uh, to get it right actually took me hours the first time. It's, it's horrible, but okay. Uh, and now I just copy paste. Bind. What? You just don't have to use bind when everything is <laughs> Well, I'm using bind, of course. Uh, it comes out of the box, and that's where the trouble starts, I guess. Okay. So, so here are some, some um, uh, things by which you can characterize these three le uh, levels, I should say. So if you take a look at, for example, geographical scale. Okay, then at the global level, it's really worldwide. Whereas at the managerial level, typically the department level or even your own private home space, so to say. If you take a look at the number of replicas, as another example, at the global, many. Replicas could also involve caching, okay? So if you can assume, here comes a crucial point, if you can assume that the binding from name to what it stands for, and I'll just keep it simple, an IP address, if that doesn't change, please replicate as much as you can. I'll come to that in just a minute, why that's really so efficient. But at the lowest layer, if you're gonna change a lot the mapping between a name and its contact address, which could already involve changing a file name, you do not do replication because every change would mean an update to many replicas. You don't want that. So massive replication at the highest layers, essentially no replication at the lowest layer. And something in the, in the middle is uh, moderately replicated. 
Okay, so and y you can easily look at these things um, uh, by yourself. So if I would, you know, have an exam question on uh, these six items, I could ask you to kind of fill in this table at this various spots. And don't worry, you don't have to learn this by heart. You should be able to understand DNS in such a way you say, oh yeah, it's logically to do it like this or that. And if you do that, then you've understood the trade-offs in a namespace implementation. I think it's not that difficult, okay? Now, I wanna talk about iterative and recursive name resolution. <coughs> Let's start with iterative name resolution. Yes? If you have a DNS server in the house, then? Then you don't have to uh, go to all the way to the 45. And then you don't have to go to the nearest uh, other DNS server. I'm going to answer that question now. And actually, I will explain what you really have at home. So um, the happy few that just uh, raised their hands, they actually have a name server in the house. Most of us don't even have, certainly don't have a name server in the house. Most of us don't even have this thing in the house, which is a client name resolver. When you configure your uh, home network, your internet access, you use a DNS IP address. And in essence, that thing is an address of this name resolver. Yes? I am now, I'm now being a counter argument for this thing. Yes? Oh, this is interesting. You have a resolver, okay, because it's in the box, but you, uh, yeah, got it. I agree, I, uh, I, I, I rest my case. Um, um, let me phrase it like this. In the old days, when I was young, <laughs> the name resolver would be at your ISP, but uh, there was a, there's a very valid point over here. The name resolver is actually now in this small box that you buy, hire, rent, whatever from your ISP, which is placed in your home. That's actually where the DNS name resolver can actually reside. Okay? Uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's, uh, I love these type of corrections. Okay? So um, correct me where you think it should be corrected. It's, uh, it's a good point. How does iterative name resolution work? It's very simple, actually. Here's your application. Oh, I should do it like this, sorry. Here's your application, okay? And I have this abstract name. This abstract name should be read as ftp.cs.vu.nl. You forward that to your name resolver, and what you expect to be returned is the address of ftp.cs.vu.nl, okay? So you hand that thing off to your name resolver, and let's suppose that this guy knows about nothing. Well, it knows a bit about something because it knows where root name servers are. So it says, okay, I got this name. I know this is, in principle, the minimal information that I should have. And when you configure an operating system, or when you actually install your operating system, there will be this file saying, hey, here are the root servers. Okay, the root servers are at well-known addresses. And what you can do is you can send that entire name to the root name server. And what it will tell you is, go away, except that I will give you the address of the name server responsible for the NL domain. I should say the NL zone domain, okay? So here you are, request is back to you, but fortunately you do now have an address of a name server for which you can handle, hand off this part. So you send it ftp.cs.vu to the name server responsible for, let's say, the NL node in the NL uh, or in the DNS namespace. What that guy will say is, get off my back, but I have the address for the name server responsible for the VU domain, and here's your ftp.cs because I'm not going to do anything with that. So now the client's name resolver knows the address of the name server for the VU node, in the uh, total DNS namespace, hands it off ftp.cs, then 
uh, the story repeats. Let's just keep it simple. It says, I know the na address of the name server responsible for the CS domain, and then you do this. And then finally, you know the address of the name, of the, of the entity associated with the name, ftp.cs.view.nl. Okay? That's iterative name resolution. Recursive name resolution, in that case, everybody's so kind to you. Because what you do is you forward your request to your local name resolver, it hands over the entire name, and the root says, welcome. I will return you the address. I don't know it right now, but don't worry about that. I know where the NL server is. I'll pass the whole name to, to that guy. And then that guy's, oh, yeah, sure, come on over here with a request, blah, blah, blah. And it moves up the totem pole again, and the root name server says, ah, I got my answer. Let me return that to you, dear client of me. This doesn't happen. Why not? Scalability. Well, in fact, oh, that's an interesting one. Why do you say this? And only for that reason, because, now I'm going to tease you. Um, so what is scalability? Hold it, hold it. Watch out. If I'm asking you this question, I'm now in a mode that in distributed systems, you point here, it hurts over there, right? So we discussed scalability, right? So I, let me rephrase my question. Which scalability do you mean? Um, I think I actually mean I haven't looked at the scalability. That's not the correct answer. We discussed three types of scalability. So I should not have mentioned scalability. Oh, no, you should have. It's a very good answer. Size scalability. So your argument would be, in the context of size scalability, you're over, you may be overloading the root. Correct answer. In terms of geographical scalability, what then? Why? Oh, I should repeat this. Could be better. Yes? Yes, correct, absolutely correct. So, and it doesn't have to be the case. So now you have the complete answer. From a size scalability point of view, recursive name resolution is not a good idea. And in fact, it is not implemented this way. It's not even supported this way. From a geographical scalability point of view, this may actually make a lot of sense if I show you this slide. Okay, so I'm now moving forward a bit. I'll go back in just a minute. If I'm... My, if I'm the client name resolver is over here and the root name server that I have to go over is way over there, okay? So let's say I am here in San Francisco and I'm trying to resolve a name way over here in the Netherlands. And let's assume that the root name server is somewhere over here. I go over here and my request goes back. Yes, this takes a while, okay? <laughs> okay, I know where the root name server is, so you walk back. I'm glad I'm not uh, putting this on, uh, on video, okay? <laughs> so now you're over here, and then you move back again. You see the point, okay? Now watch this. Now let's do the recursive name resolution. I walk over there. You get the point, right? This is the great uh, visualization. I'm over here. Ah, vu. Uh, up, up, down, and I'm back. That's it. Oh, you may laugh, but that's actually what happens. So it's whoop, 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 whoop. That's a lot of latency, or it's over there, tuck, 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 and back. So recursive name resolution may be much better from a geographical scalability point of view, but may not be good from a size scalability point of view. And I'm emphasizing this to try to get you in that type of mindset, okay? So again, you see a trade-off here. And distributed systems is all about trade-offs, and there's never a correct answer. Well, never. Most of the time. You first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm, and I thought I made that as assumption explicit. Yeah, but in, in the lab, it could be that one's over, one's yeah. over there. Yeah, absolutely. 
So that's the reason why it's not a ground truth. That's always that case. Absolutely. Yes? Yes, I'm assuming we're only talking about authoritative servers here and not about uh, DNS resources caching. No, I haven't talked about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes? In uh, most ISPs, actually, the DNS servers that they provide you and are reconfigured in your modern phone actually is using RSA. I know. To save you from. Yeah. So, so uh, let's now get into some details, okay? So what I just mentioned was um, I, I made a very blunt statement. You do not do recursive name resolution. You do only iterative name resolution. Not true. What you do is what you find in practice is by default. Mm, no, I'm not going to say it like this. What you will find in practice is that the higher level authoritative DNS name servers do not support recursive name resolution, but at the ISP level, you do have recursive name resolution because it's doable over there uh, and it, it, it leads to a better geographical scalability because then it's confined within an ISP. And that's what you see in practice. And as far as I know, the uh, recursive name resolution is supported at the two, low, two or th at most three lowest levels, if I'm correct. It's, uh, um, it's the recursive resolver that does the uh, iterative lookup. Yes. But to the client, it's recursion uh, because the client just asks the. Oh. The, the, so, so let me rephrase what you're saying. Does the client notice anything about the iterative versus the recursive stuff? No, it doesn't. It just gets an answer back. That's exactly what kind of happens over here, okay? And you can shield that by means of all kinds of proxies and, uh, and other kind of stuff so that, it, for example, stays at the ISP level. So once you contact the ISP, you actually will get your answer back, and that's it. Okay. Yes? You have to speak up a bit. I know you're... Uh, I, I, will, I will not record this one. <laughs> Yes? Then you don't go to the root? If you what? If you? Then you don't go to the root. Uh, let me explain why you hardly ever go to the root. And it will be interesting to see. If you want to check out what the latency is in DNS, start entering wrong DNS names. Okay? Because they will need to be resolved, and then you'll get an impression of what the actual performance is of DNS. Now, why does DNS perform so well? Here's a rather intricate table, completely optimized for recursive name resolution. Why? Because that's where caching is so, so efficient. So let's just go through it, and halfway you'll understand that, hey, there's kind of a rhythm to this. So here I have a bunch of servers responsible for a specific node in the DNS tree, CS, VU, NL, and root, okay? And this guy over here is requested to resolve FTP. So what it does, it does not pass it to a child because it knows it. It doesn't receive anything, and it returns the request to this address. Who requested this one? That was the VU node. So here you go, FTP.CS. It looks up the address of CS, passes FTP the child, it gets the address of FTP back, and here it comes. It caches that one and that one. It ret returns to the request of these two. Okay, so you're passing back more addresses than just FTP.CS. Likewise, when you go to the NL server, you can pass back more. You hand over, uh, you look up this one, you pass this to the child, it now receives this answer, and it caches it, and it passes the whole information back up the tree. This is all theory, by the way, but this is how it works. I wouldn't, theory that works in practice. This is how it works in principle. So what you can see is that you can build up a lot of information from previous lookups. Now let's go back to the iterative scheme. And what you will notice is that the name resolver can cache a lot. And not only every name resolver can cache a lot, okay? And notably, if you've once 
you, you actually already know the name of the root, okay? But if you look up one of these top level domains, hey, these things are stable, right? So you cache it. And that means that you never have to go to the root again to look up what the address is of the NL name server. Of course, that entry in your cache will expire. And I don't know exactly, is this also two days for the top level domains? It's very long. It should be very long. So you can set timeouts on those values. Those timeouts actually are either well known or actually are provided by other servers. You cache that and then you know I can use this, this address for a very, very long time. And then you don't have to go to the root. And the same goes for the lower level name servers. And the lower, the lower you go, the smaller the timeouts are on how long you're allowed to cache that file. And this is the reason why DNS works so really swell, because you almost have the complete information on the domain name that you need to resolve. In many cases, only the last bit isn't there. You know, the FTP. Okay, but you know where, you don't even have to know where the root name server is. You know where uh, cs.vu.nl is, so hey, bingo, you forward that thing, FTP, to that name server and you get your answer back. That's the reason why DNS works so nicely. So if you insert a wrong domain name, deliberately, um, and then let's hope we're not doing any negative caching, you will get an impression of how slow DNS could be. And DNS can be really slow, really slow. Um, there have been studies where um, you could have, uh, let's say on average it would take 30 seconds to get an answer back. Sometimes it took minutes, if not hours. Is that due to latency? No, it's due to misconfigured DNS servers. And this is kind of a common thing in the internet. Routers are misconfigured and DNS servers and any server is misconfigured. Okay. Dear DNS experts, did I do good enough? Okay. I am not going to repeat this. <laughs> let, me, let me just put it like this, just for, for the recording. I once said, hey, this is theory and practice is just around the corner. He says, well, you've got to walk a long way before you hit that corner. Thank you very much. Practice hurts more. <laughs> practice hurts more. That's what I buy. No, okay, so, so uh, in all fairness, of course, I am going over many, many gory details. And if you uh, need to maintain a DNS system for real, it is more than I'm willing to explain in about 10 minutes, okay? But uh, I challenge you in the sense that I skip any of the principles. I think not. And that's, that's, now this is the first time ever in class that I can actually defend distributed systems, principles, and paradise. That's the subtitle. Okay. Um, and actually, I just mentioned some of the scalability issues uh, just a while ago. Okay. Uh, let me briefly discuss. Do I want to do this? Mm, yes, I do. I, wanted to, I was thinking, do I want to discuss decentralized DNS? Uh, I want to now discuss it for two reasons. Um, one reason is because I got a beautiful link to uh, a decentralized DNS. But it, this slide also shows you what is actually the information that is contained in DNS. Um, so those who are familiar with DNS, you've been looking at, I always like this, the DNS database. Well, the DNS database is, is a file, okay? No more than that. And uh, yes, it is kind of painful to configure it so, so that it works the first time. Um, but basically what you'll find are different types of records and it's just a text file, okay? Um, the most important one is, where is it? Oh, is the, is the A record? The A record contains the IP address of your entity. The entity is always, um, is always is associated with a domain name. Now another one that's interesting is actually the MX file. It's for a mail server. Um, and too bad that I didn't actually uh, provide this. So when you look up an address such as uh, stain at cs.vu.nl, what happens strictly 
is that you do not instantly get back the IP address of anything. What you get back is information on the mail server that is responsible for the cs.vue.nl domain. And then what you should strictly do, it's a name, it's a, again a domain name, and what you should strictly do is look up that name, and in principle what you'll be looking up is the A address associated with the mail server responsible for the cs.vue.nl domain. But DNS knows that uh, you're going to do this anyway, so what it does is it says, oh, by the way, I have a hint for you, because the IP address of the mail server that you're looking for is actually this one, and you get this back as part directly of your lookup for the MX record of uh, the mail server responsible for that domain. Only when, they, uh, only when the mail server is within the same domain. And only when the mail server is within the same domain. And there are other details where you, know, you would deviate from this. But I, I was giving this example to show that uh, in this database, you have different types of records, and I'm really, I'm, let me emphasize, I'm really providing the most simplest case, okay? Uh, because DNS gets nasty when you have um, mail servers, for example, handling the stuff for another domain. Then you get different types of information back. But this is the mindset that you get. You ask to resolve a specific, a specific record type in a DNS domain, and you do this by going to a name server. Now, there's a terrific tool out there. It's called DIG, D-I-G. Um, if you want to see what is actually held by a DNS name server, you use this tool called DIG. And I would encourage you to do that because you will get a lot of useful information and it will give you instantly an idea of what is actually stored in the DNS. Yes. The option that you're looking for when you're using dig is plus trace. I always just use dig with a server name and I get a lot of information back. So I told you when I, I mentioned dig, you know, the suggestion is do this at home. So now you have the situation that there's a student who doesn't explicitly say this, but Martin, he says, do this at home. I will follow up your suggestion and do dig plus trace. Curious to see what's going to come out of that. Um, now, let's move to decentralized DNS. Because the name resolution scheme in DNS is that you walk through this tree and then you find, and then you get these records. What you can also do, and let's try to move DNS to a structured peer-to-peer -peer system. What you can also do is that on the slide? Uh, yes, it is actually, too bad. Otherwise, I could have asked a question about this. What you could do is you can take a domain name, you hash it, you have a key. Got it? So let's say that you have your really great um, Cadelnia peer-to-peer system, which is out and running over there. And what you can do is you can hash your domain names and then you route through that peer-to-peer -peer network to the node responsible for that key and you ask for the record associated with that key. This is clear to everyone. I just made a fully decentralized DNS name server. Name service, I should say. And I can make this as big and small as I can, as I want to. The only drawback, and this may be a serious drawback, is that because I have no relationship, unless I apply really intricate tricks, between, for example, um, cs.vue.nl and .nl, I've, I've lost that. The information on .nl is way somewhere else stored in a node than the information on cs.vue.nl. I just broke that relationship, so I can't ask the NL node, what do you have about the CS domain? Because that information is no longer there. So in principle, what you could do in DNS is do an LS minus L on one of the intermediate nodes. 
And you'll get a lot of information back if that node is willing to provide you that information. You can do this on the root, okay, to give you an idea. Now that, that link is lost, but otherwise, here you have it, your perfect decentralized DNS implementation. That's the only thing I wanted to say about decentralized DNS, okay? Um, there are two more slides and then we'll finish. Um, how many of you have heard about LDAP? Many of you have heard about LDAP. How many of you know how LDAP works? Less, okay. Let me tell you how LDAP works. Practice is just around the corner. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put up your own LDAP server. Well, LDAP is actually a bit more int intricate than, uh, than DNS. Um, I just explained that when you have a namespace, you can store all kinds of attributes in, these, in the nodes itself, right? And what you can do with many namespaces is do exactly the same, and what you get is uh, something that is comparable to the um, yellow pages, as it's called. Uh, in Dutch, it's uh, the Gouden Gids, and indeed in English, it's the Yellow Pages. And uh, they are still distributed, these things. I got really nasty when I got this chunk of paper. You know, it just, they, they hand it through your mailing box, your physical one at home. I mean, bonk, this is what you hear. And then the first thing I do is I pick this up and I throw it away. And then I complain at the council saying, will you please stop sending me this stuff because it's just a waste of trees. No, we're not going to do this. Sorry, this has nothing to do with distributed systems, but you get the point, okay? Oh, I'm not suggesting that you should throw away LDAP. So another trick is you use these yellow pages to look up people who are belonging to these yellow pages. So suddenly you're looking for a plumber. And the big difference with DNS is, in DNS, you know what you're looking for. It's plumber.cs.vu.nl. No, that will not point to me, by the way. So if you <laughs> I was thinking, what am I saying here? What you're looking for is, please give me plumbers. Whether they are at CS, at the VU, or at the UVA, or you know, in Rotterdam, I don't care. I want to have plumbers, and you can confine this to local information. But now you're doing a very different type of lookup. Notice that this comes close to what I described with published subscribe systems. You throw in keywords into a search space, and you're asking what matches plumber. And what you should get back is a bunch of IP addresses that matches plumber. Okay, and that's where the difficulty starts. So um, the lookup operations can now suddenly be very expensive because you have to run through a search space. Okay, um, and this is really it. It's requested attribute values against actual attribute values. This is exactly the same problem that we encountered with the shared data space stuff. So are you noticing, by the way, that as I travel through the book, I can refer back to situations that we had before. This is, you punch, punch here, it hurts over there principle. Okay, now, if you have this, imagine that you would have to implement yellow pages on an internet scale. It's not gonna work, right? Because the, what I will be arguing is that in essence, what you would need to do is have a centralized server that returns all plumbers of the world. Well, that's not gonna work. And you could maybe be able to optimize things that plumbers in, in the Netherlands or plumbers in Germany or whatnot, but still it will be a centralized entity. So what people do in practice is that they actually combine things. And this is what LDAP actually is about. And to keep things very simple, um, well, you can read how it's organized here on the slide actually, and it's also in the book. But what you do is you have a bunch of, I'll keep it simple, local LDAP servers and you impose a DNS structure on top of all these LDAP servers and you use the normal name resolution to go to a specific LDAP server. See how I'm combining deterministic white pages lookup with yellow pages lookup. I'm saying I want to know all the users at the VU. Okay, then you'll have a path .nl view 
LDAP. I, I don't think it exists, but that doesn't matter, okay? That will point to the local, local, centralized LDAP server here at the VU. That's where you can then launch your query for all users and you will get your answer. So the search is now confined to a relatively small search space. This is the reason why attribute-based naming can work in practice, provided you have this hierarchical st namespace structure on top of it. Okay, yes? Yes. And there are some, there is, this would imp uh, imply that every organization would have to use the same naming schemes for their LDAP uh, uh, directories. The answer is yes. Uh, there is standardization and there is uh, consensus for certain attribute types. That's absolutely the case. But otherwise, you are right. You cannot, in that sense, compare different LDAP servers to each other and you will get uh, you will have to know about what you could ask one and what you cannot ask the other absolutely true okay I'm on time see you tomorrow <laughs>